Gospel of John, chapter 2. <clears throat> and of course, part of your homework last time was to read, uh, if nothing else, read verses 13 through 17. How many of you were faithful to read? Raise your hands. Okay, good. Put them down. How many of you used the uh, method that I showed you last class, and that was to write down the elements or the things, that, and I mean, and I'm asking, how many of you wrote down the elements or the things of that? Raise your hands. Oh, good. That's way more than I expected. How many of you didn't write them down, but you noted them as you read? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of them just couldn't care less about the method I talked about and <laughs> just said, hey, I never get anything, and I'm going to con Continue to never get anything because nobody's going to tell me. <clears throat> um, what we want to do is, is uh, do a similar thing. I tell you, John is just a wonderful, wonderful book for being able to uh, take the elements that are there, write them down, lay them out, and then ask the Holy Spirit to tell you what you're dealing with. I, I will tell you this, that if you read this, if you read it and you say, show me, you won't get near as much as if you read it and then you write down all the key things that are there. Remember last time we wrote down vessels and wine and wedding and remember? And if you write them down, I guarantee when you write those words down, the Holy Spirit will move on them. But if you're just kind of reading them, because first of all, you've been reading the Bible ever since you've been a Christian. You just read. You've learned to read without comprehending. You've learned to just pour over uh, passages of scriptures and, and just kind of say, I know what that means. So what we're trying to do is give you a different method, a different way, so that it gives the Holy Spirit a better chance to show you. And see, nobody, I mean, you know, yes, the Lord shows pastors and teachers and evangelists and all this. He shows them more things because that's their responsibility to share. But in reality, I'll tell you, most of, the, most of the notes that you've heard me read from, not just in John class, but in all classes, I got way before I was a pastor, way before I ever thought I was considered to be a pastor. I got it, frankly, because I was just wanting the Lord, and God is no respecter of persons in that sense. No, maybe you won't see things quite the way I do or whatever, but the Lord wants to share His Word with you, and He wants you to have fellowship with Him through the word all right so you remember that we've talked about jesus in the beginning was the word the logos the complete thought and concept of god so every time it mentions jesus in the scripture it's not just mentioning jesus of nazareth some guy that lived two thousand years ago that only got to minister for the last three and a half years it's going to be talking about the logos the complete thought and concept of god it's going to be talking about the preeminence. And if you'll notice, this will be this, just the second example that we've had. But if you'll notice, there are, and this is, this is what we talked about before, there are elements in those passages, particular passages, that contain things. Things being certain people, not just people. You don't just generalize. I mean, there are, uh, in fact, uh, one good example is... Uh, Look in um, verse 11 and 12. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Now notice verse 12 of the first chapter, or second chapter of John. After this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it said he went down with his brethren. Jesus had brothers and sisters. Did you know that? The Bible talks about them. In fact, one of the books of the New Testament was written by one of his brothers. Who knows which one? Yeah. Interesting. The book of James was written by, J not, not James of Peter, James, and John, 
but James, the brother of Jesus, who later replaced James as, as kind of the head of the church. Um, a lot of people don't know that. They always thought Peter was the head of the church because of the Catholic, the Pope thing and everything. All you have to do is read your Bible and you'll find out that that wasn't the case. You know, there's a lot of stuff you can shoot down with the wrong theology and wrong denominationalism and everything else. I was, when I first got saved, I was reading in Acts and found that, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there on the day of Pentecost and got filled with the Holy Spirit. And I love telling Catholics after that, that did you know that Mary was uh, spoken tongues? You know, I love that because she did. And it's proved it's right there in their Bible, you know. And uh, so... <laughs> Uh, and, you know, not to be divisive or whatever, I mean, to me, the Word of God is the Word of God. It comes first before your denomination, before mine or anybody else's. And if it says it right there in your Bible and my Bible, then maybe we ought to believe what the Bible says and not what denominationalism has taught it. And that's why we say search the Scriptures, know the Word of God. That way you don't get deceived when you know what it says. So... Uh, the, uh, Jesus' mother and his brethren here is talking about his literal brothers and sisters. Now, they weren't full brothers and sisters, were they? Because they, they all had the same mother. But they didn't have the same father. His brother's their father was Joseph. Jesus' father was, he remembers a virgin birth, you know, was God. So, uh, they, uh, you could call them half-brothers, certainly in the flesh. When they got born again, they were full brothers because they all had the same father, born of the same father. Amen? <laughs> uh, it's also interesting, I mean, like I said, okay, so you have things and people, and I, when I said that, I brought these scriptures up to say that there are, okay, the Bible mentions people, it mentions, uh, you know, uh, put down people, you don't just generalize in your mind, it mentions his mother, the brethren, the disciples. In the other one, we looked at the servants. In the other scriptures from last class, we looked at the servants. We looked at the wedding guests. We looked at the mother. And we saw that they were all developing different relationships to Jesus. Now, if that's true, if it's true in the Bible that people can develop a different relationship, same Jesus, but people have a different relationship, then if you, would, if you want to grow in relationship to the Lord, it's good to understand those relationships and proceed toward what you desire in the Lord, whosoever will. You can get, I believe that you can get as close to Jesus as you want. I mean, I don't believe he's a respecter of persons, but I think that, you know, be it unto you according to your faith all, you know, I'm just a nobody or da 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 whatever you want to say. But I believe that he wants you as close as you can get. But that's up to you and your desire. And this is one way to begin to look at the difference. And, and here it says, just those few scriptures there, it says, And the disciples believed on him, and his mother and his brethren and the disciples went to Capernaum. And if you and if you read the scriptures, you know that you know, there was some doubt with his mother and his brothers for a while, for a long while. There was some doubt. And, and that's a point that once you see something like that where the disciples believe, but it doesn't mention that the mother and brother believe, you start going through, reading through, looking specifically for mother and brothers, and you start finding scriptures that talks about them, and then you begin to see their relationship. They doubt it, or they're questioning, or they're going, you know... Uh, in some place, they almost mocked him. You know, one place, well, why don't you go on up and, you know, show everybody that you're the big hot shot, you know? And Jesus is going, my time is not yet, you know? So um, these things will help you to know the scriptures better and will also help you understand relationships to the Lord and, and put you in those situations where you can grow in your relationship with the Lord. Okay, so... Um, Let's go ahead and read uh, right now verses 13 through 17 of the second chapter of John. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take away these things from here. Take 
make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so what are some of the elements? What are some of the things <coughs> that are mentioned here? Okay. We'll go ahead and put it down. Cattle, uh, dove, okay. What else? Uh-huh. It was the Passover, good. I wonder if that has any significance. <coughs> Ricky? Somebody else? Uh-huh. Money. Okay, good. All right, this is enough to get us started here. Obviously, there are more <coughs> elements than that. But we said last class that there are things. So you find out what the things are. These Things are put together in a certain way, in a certain order, that describe a certain circumstance or situation. That's all that life is. Things put in a certain order, that's all life is. That's all it is. Okay. But we saw from the first chapter, in the beginning was the Word before He created this. The Word, the Logos created all. All things were made by Him. But before that, there was this relationship with God the Father and his son, who was known as the Logos, the complete thought and concept of God. And we saw that from that relationship and that reality, things came into existence, and therefore, from things, you cannot, you cannot fully understand the greater truths by just looking at things. But <clears throat> things have meaning because all things were created by him and for him and to him and, you know... So they, they have meaning, but only in light of the true meaning, which is the Father and his relationship with his Son. Only in light of that relationship, because that's all that it gives you. The Word, the Logos, was with. Speaking of fellowship, speaking of, of uh, intimate union. <clears throat> and so this being the real, this being temporal, set up in time, and will one day all be done away with. So, understanding that in the scriptures, how about understanding life in the same way? That life is simply things put together in a certain order that's called your circumstances. And so what do we do? We enter into our circumstances. We see the things. We don't like the order that they're set up in. It brings fear to our heart or whatever or, you know, oh no, you know, my God, you know. Um, and so instead of seeing things, scriptures like this one, all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. To those that love God who are called according to his purpose. Not your purpose. My purpose is to have all my things in good working order and all my relationships in good working order and happy and joyous and wonderful and to have no sickness and no sadness and that's that's mine that's not god's god's son is so greater than that that he would enter into the world of things and die on a cross that was made out of wood that was thi a thing that he created and die on that in order to bring us back into a reality that is much greater than the things just to wake us up, just to, if you will, enlighten us to his reality. And so then, so then you begin to <clears throat> look at life not just as random circumstances. We were talking about that uh, on Sunday where we were talking about uh, uh, Jeremiah prophesying. Uh, and he says, you know, 70 years you shall be in captivity. <clears throat> And we go, oh, man, why 70 years, man? You know, I'm already 20, 70, or I'll be 90 years old before we get out of captivity. Why, se why not like 40, Lord? You know, we just think he picked some random number, and then we discovered that 
that was how many years it would take for the land to lie, receive its Sabbaths, okay? And then uh, some of you may or may not remember in past we talked about um, Elijah on, on Mount Carmel. And here, uh, you know, there's this contest between him and all the prophets of Baal. And the prophets of Baal are, you know, saying, well, you know, we'll have this contest and, and whoever can bring fire down on their sacrifice, whoever's God answers by fire, that's who wins. So we go, well, we know Elijah's going to win there because he's God's man and God's going to support him. God isn't going to let him fail. I mean, you know, God is, is going to be with him because... I mean, he's, you know, Elijah set this up and, and, and God wouldn't let his man look bad. And that ain't what happened at all. At all. What happened was, Elijah said, you go first because there was, he understood the word of God and the timing of God. And he said, you guys go first. And they're all, you know, doing this and that and cutting themselves and everything, you know. And they're going, ah! And they're screaming and yelling and trying to get God to move and to bring fire and nothing happened. And it's almost like Elijah sitting there kind of looking at his watch going, uh, I better keep going a little while longer. And they're going, well, okay, that'll give us more time, you know. Yeah, you know, and they're doing all this stuff. And they say, oh, oh man, I don't know, man. You know, and uh, you want to, you're shouting, no, y'all go about uh, 20 more minutes. Uh, uh, and then finally goes, uh, my turn. And it says... And at the time of the evening sacrifice, Elijah walked over and said, now is my turn. See, that's not random. That's knowing the word of God. That's flowing with the principles of God. That's, that's coming under something that was established long before you and I were here. Long before you and I were here. And the, the Sabbath year thing was established long before you and I were here and if you don't do it and if 70 years has passed guess how many years you go into captivity it's real easy to figure out if you know the word of God and if you're plugged into the Lord but if you're not then you go life is so random how do I know you know like um, one time God blesses you or helps you and the next time he doesn't and you go well I prayed just as hard you know and, and you, it's confusing but it's not confusing when you're it's like we say, well, you know, what I did was I, um, I, I got on my knees and I kind of went, oh, and God moved that time. So we make this doctrine of getting on your knees and going, oh, you know. And God, for some reason, tends to honor things for a while, but after a while he goes, look, you know. And I'll give you another example. Um, in the Old Testament, and of course we're going to get to that actually in the next chapter, but I'll... I'll go ahead and give you the example now because there's so much to cover that there's no way. So I'll just throw stuff at you. Um, <clears throat> in the Old Testament, when they were going through the wilderness and uh, 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 the people had sinned against God. And so um, uh, God sent these serpents among them. And the serpents were biting them. And when they'd bite them, they would swell up and they would get sick and they were dying. Left and right, left and right. And so, and you can read the story, it's right there in Exodus. So Moses goes, he goes to the Lord and he said, Oh Lord, heal the people. And God says, no. What do you mean no? What do you mean no? I mean, you're a God that heals, healings everything. I mean, we know that you do all this healing stuff. Why don't, what do you mean no? And he says, no, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go make a brass serpent and a brass pole and put that brass serpent on a pole. And I want you to get in the midst of the people and hold it up. And everybody that looks on that brass serpent and sees it will be healed. Lord, just got the cute tricks. Why don't you just heal them? Just, just kind of go, be healed. Because... He was not desiring to heal them, but to, and like I said, uh, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Everything points to Christ and Him crucified. Everything has eternal value to it, but we're just going, well, I need healing and you need to move. You know, but he says, no, I'm not going to just heal them because if I just heal them, they'll just get, go sin again and they'll get bit again. 
I'd rather do something greater than a healing. I'd rather bring them into the fullness of the understanding of Christ and Him crucified. And then, as the, His life is formed in you, you don't need to be running off sinning and getting healing again or whatever. Right? So, He puts the brass, He puts it up there, and the ones that looked and saw it, okay, anybody know, uh, familiar with uh, uh, brass, what it represents? Judgment. Judgment. Okay? Then what does the uh, serpent represent? Curse and, and Satan, obviously, the, the serpent that deceived Eve, uh, represents uh, Satan. And what does the serpent judged brass on a pole represent? Well, of course, I just read that. As the serpent on the pole is lifted up, so must the Son of Man that Jesus became, he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. In other words, he took that on him, you know. He didn't become a lamb in that sense, in that picture, because they didn't need the lamb at that point killed. They needed their old nature crucified. And so when they saw that it was dead, crucified, then when, when they saw and believed, they were healed, but not just healed, but made whole. Difference, right? They were made whole. And, and so, but you see, what happened? Just like every other time, what happened? They stick that little thing away. You don't really, see, you don't really hear a lot about the, 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 the serpent on the brass pole a lot, but you find way back over in, I forget, I think it's in Kings, you look way back, years and years and years later, and one of the good guys, Hezekiah, I think it was, walks into the temple, finds the brass serpent. This is years and years and years and years later, and breaks it up into pieces and takes it and throws it away and calls it Neshitan. Probably not the best pronunciation in the world, but what it means is a piece of brass. It doesn't say, it just says Neshitan, and you look it up and it goes, a piece, it was a piece of brass. They started worshiping it, just like we do. God moves through something, some man for a while. We worship him, lift him up. God has to take him out. Some method, pray for an hour in the morning, and then we worship that, and then he has to remove that. Something, we always make the thing instead of the Lord, the, the reality. We start lifting that up higher than the Lord, and so it's got to come in and take it away and take our little toys away and get our eyes back on Jesus. Huh? Great. Yeah. not going to stop abortion. Stop her from going to hell, though, I guarantee that. Well, I got saved in the Jesus movement. I always thought if Mick Jagger got saved, we'd reach the world, you know, and now I know different, but, you know. But, but I remember my first couple of years in the Lord, I'm going, oh, Lord, save Mick Jagger, you know, and this is going to do it, you know. <laughs> uh Okay, we're jumping ahead a little bit with the spiritual application, but what the thing that you've seen is a word that says up 
that could simply just to us, if we just read through it and we don't, I mean, one of the advantages of laying things out is, I really believe that if you just do that and then you just start looking, you go, whoa, there's something here. But if you just tend to read, we just, I don't know, we just tend to read and go, I don't know why. It's almost like we expect something to jump out and grab us, whoa, you know. And it doesn't usually work that way. I mean, sometimes it does, but usually it is as you just very carefully, and that's why I appreciate some of the particular words that were, you know, brought out that, you know, that maybe you wouldn't, you, you know, you, we get so used to, we have religious words, don't we? And we get so used to our words that we don't even think. We just go, oh, I, I automatically, I don't even have to say that I automatically know what that is. I just know what it is, so... You know, well, there ain't nothing there. You know. Did I see somebody's hand over here? Uh-huh. Yes. And chew on it. You know, it's meditating on it. It's, uh, you know how a, child, a cow chews its cud? Just kind of, you know. You just chew on it. You don't have to, you, you know, there's not this, uh, oh, I've got to get something. You know, I've only got a certain amount of time. I've got to get something, you know. Uh, you will find that if you'll chew on something, the Lord can give you a whole lot more. You've seen that, haven't you? Anybody ever gone to bed and told, oh, i got to go to sleep? never works you know it, it you know it's when you relax finally and usually we relax because we're so worn out trying to go to sleep we just go oh, we just pass out because we're so tired of worrying about how to get to sleep you know and uh and if you relax and in this case it's not just physically but it is to trust the lord to trust the one you know Okay, so we have these elements. Uh, verse 13, in the uh, Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. The first thing I noticed there was the Jews' Passover. The Jews' Passover. If you look in Exodus uh, chapter 12 and chapter 13, there it, it's, it's the first mention of the Passover, and there it is called the Lord's Passover. The Lord's Passover. And you go, okay. Okay, now what is the difference? Why is there a change? And then you begin to realize that you begin to see how then and now, I mean, the church begins to deteriorate. And, and something that was originally the Lord's becomes man and man-centered or, or nation-centered or denomination-centered or whatever. And Christ pretty soon begins to be moved out. And it is something God did for us, and that's fine. He does do it for us. But, folks, our place is to honor Him. His place is to bless us, to take care of us. But our place is not to say, yes, that's right, and he, everything is for us, but to honor back this direction. So it's, it's this kind of a relationship. But you start taking it in, you're, you're going to pervert it. <laughs> Absolutely. That's really good because now, now he's really bringing out the truth here. This is on the Passover. He enters the temple on the Passover. And the spirit that should be there is one of self-giving, of death to self, of fear before the Lord, not in a negative sense, but to honor and, and respect and fear the Lord. And he comes in and it's, uh, they're all profiting by it. Uh-huh, Molly? Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. 
Well, a lot of times if somebody comes to your house that's a stranger, even if you let them in the house, you might even have them stand at the front door and tell you what their deal is or stand just on the inside. But if you let them sit down, you have moved a step further. That's a good point. Uh-huh. That's good. It's real good. You guys, that's good. That's good. Do you hear the three we've been hearing from over here? Good. Yeah. Um, this Passover thing, too, I really I really appreciate what you saw there, Chos, because the Passover's not just from the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, or let's get specific, in the Gospel of John. You know, Jesus ministered for three and a half years. Jesus experienced three Passovers during his walk and his time of ministry. And you know what? They're all mentioned in the Gospel of John. This is the first, his first Passover after he began to minister. The second one you can uh, flip over is not very far. How, how, how much time passed between one Passover and the other? A year. Okay? Flip over to, just so, just so we can look at it, uh, John chapter 6. John chapter 6 and verse 4. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. That's his second Passover. And on the third Passover is when he, uh, when he died, right? He died on Passover, right? Everybody knows that? Okay. Um, uh, before we go to the third one, I want you to consider what is said and shared between chapter 2 where we're at and just in my Bible, one to three pages away is a whole year. A whole year. Now, I want to say this. We tend to, uh, you know, the book of Acts is the same way, except for it's not some one person's lifetime. It is spread over a long, long period of time. But we read it, and we see all this stuff going, boom, 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 boom. You know what I mean? I mean, everything's happening. This, you know, but we don't realize that you know, there's a long stretch taking place in there. So we go, well, every time I turn around, there should be some great this or that happening. Now, I believe that the, to find out what's, what you're really made out of is not in the great happening times, but is in some of the stretches where you have to trust the Lord. Not a lot's going on. And that's where you find a whole lot of people fall away because they have no root in themselves, and then they... They fall away. But you find stability. And, and uh, that's another reason for the, we were talking about the Sabbaths. That's another reason for the year, the, every Sabbath, every, so that the ground can rest, so they can rebuild, so it can do this and that. You could sit there in one of the Sabbath times and, say, and not know you're in the Sabbath year where it's not a lot going on and go, man, Last year was the greatest year I ever had because he said, I'll bless in the sixth year to help you through that one. And you go, but this year nothing's going on, man. I don't know what to say. Another one of those confusing things that it is ordered of the Lord, but we don't know what the order is. And so we're confused. And we're going, God, what's going on here? I mean, nothing big's happening and, you know, this and that. God knows what he's doing. I mean, really, that's, that's one of the reasons why we call Jesus Lord. It's not just a nifty title that we can apply, but has no meaning. I mean, if he's Lord, he's Lord. I mean, in church, we even really take it to extremes and say he's Lord of all. Well, come on. You know, if the church really believed he was Lord of all, we wouldn't be having near the problems that we have. People wouldn't be near as freaked out as they usually are, wouldn't they? There's no way. Because if he's Lord of all, then he's Lord over that. Didn't get any hearty amens on that, but that's the truth. I mean, if we really, really believe that he's Lord of all, you know, King of kings and Lord of lords, we go, oh man, you see something that is a, a Lord in your life or is a Lord in your circumstances, you know, your boss or this or that, and you go, well, you know, yeah, but I mean, he's got authority and he's able to push me around and do that. But, but then we say Jesus is king of kings. You know? 
we, w we just want him to be king where there's no other influence at all. That's what we want. So that everything is just rosy all the time. But you know, you're never going to find out how much you trust the Lord until you're put in a situation where you have to trust the Lord. If he's just Lord and lording over the devil and slaps him out of the way just because he, he looked in your direction and slaps his financial situation away before it reaches you so you, you never panic, you're never going to know that you, that you trust him no matter what that he is your Lord, if, he, if right now he is not manifesting himself as Lord over the devil, or he's not manifesting himself as Lord over my finances, I beg your pardon, he is still my Lord just because I don't see it there and there does not mean I have to deny the Lordship of Jesus Christ over me. I not only don't deny it, I intentionally pull myself under that Lordship and say, Jesus is my Lord, he is my source, he is my protector. He is my keeper. He is the one that is going to take care of every need. I don't panic unless I have an agenda and he's not either meeting it or not meeting it based on my timetable. So that would make me Lord and him the servant of me, the Lord. Wouldn't it? Hello? <laughs> that would make me the Lord and he would be serving my purposes. So that's when you have to say, okay, you know, uh, I think me and Letha were talking about this, and she said, uh, anytime you experience frustration, you're probably looking, what you had, looking somewhere. Something's out of line with the Lord, and that's usually right, because we're, you know, frustration is usually there's something that we want, and there's something that's holding that back. And so we go, oh, man, you know, Lord, you know, isn't that silly? Lord, you know. <laughs> You, you, you remember the example I've used a couple of times where, where Jesus said, you know, I'm going to go die on the cross, and Peter said, not so, Lord, and you don't put those two together, not so and Lord, you know what I mean? I mean, you, you, you say, yes, sir, Lord, but you don't say, not so, Lord, you know. <clears throat> and Jesus even said this. I mean, see, you know, now you say, well, Randy, that's really good, and you're bringing out a real truth with that, but I want you to think about something. I think that what I'm saying in relation to this is the way that Jesus feels about it. And here's why. Based on the scripture that I've seen that I believe reveals his heart, Jesus turned to his own disciples, not the sinners, not the brothers and sisters, not the mother. He turned to his own disciples and he said, Why call ye me Lord and not do what I say? I think that it's important to him. Uh, we can't understand that because he doesn't have a... He, he doesn't have a personality. He can't be hurt. That's the way we view it. He can't be hurt. He can't be offended. He can't be, you know what I mean? I mean, if, if uh, circumstances make me doubt his lordship, well, bless God, he's still my savior, but we don't, we need, then we need to change our terminology because I believe it's important to him. I believe we need to change it and we need to say, oh, Jesus is my savior. Thank you, savior. Thank you, savior. But don't call him Lord and not trust him as Lord or do what he says. You see what I'm saying? Something that might help, of course, this is probably really going to, I'm glad we don't have any of our worship leaders here. Something you might try to do is not singing anything that you don't really believe. You know, we'll be just the opposite in Church of Christ, all music. But, but in reality, there's not a one of us that deep down, because we are born again, we do love the Lord, and we do want Jesus to be Lord. And in many ways, he is Lord. I'm not taking that away from you, and I know that that's the truth. But the Lord uses me to bring things out like this to sober us and to make us realize that we're not as spiritual as we think we are. We're not doing as well as we think we are. And the only way, and, and how are we going to, go forward. How are we going to make strides if we don't know that there are strides to be made? There has to be the law of contrast. There has to be that reality. So, so now somebody can, and there are many Christians that come and they sit and they listen and you know um, I, I, the Lord shared with me years ago. He said, Randy, this was, let's see if I can find it. I don't even know if I can find it because it's been years since I've read it. But um, He's, he uh, gave me a scripture and he said, Randy, this is, this is going to be something that you have to contend with 
uh, as, as a minister. And he didn't say uh, everybody would have to contend with it, but he said I would. And he said, and this is the scripture, I'll just read it to you. And they come unto thee as the people come. And they sit before thee as my people. And they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness, meaning what they want. You know, we don't, covetousness is an estranged word from us. It doesn't impact us. But me wanting what I want when I want it, and God, why aren't you showing up? That's covetousness, okay? Um, and they sit, bef and uh, with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come. Then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. Um, there are people, there will always be people, that will come and listen. And long after I'm gone, it may be to you, they will come and listen but it's like, like, this is why we're doing this. We don't want to just, uh, you know, you can take uh, temper paints, pour them on a piece of paper, and smear it. And if you do it just right, the colors kind of spread and blend in it. But if you do it just wrong, it's just a mess. Well, a lot of times our reading of the scripture is like we take it and we just smear it. I mean, we don't, we're, we're reading, but we're not getting anything. Jesus said, having ears to hear, we hear not. Having eyes to see, we see not. So... So when you put things down like this, when you, it, it is trying to make it where you can hear the Lord. That's all it's doing. This isn't a method that works just because it's a working method. Do you understand that? That's not what it is. It's not a method at all. It is a change up for you in order to maybe put you in a little bit better situation where then you'll notice, whoa, temple. Jesus went into the temple. What did he do in the temple? He didn't start jumping and dancing on one foot and going, in the name of Jesus, you know. And you go, hmm, this is serious. And then you begin to really examine it, especially when you fall, your eyes fall on verse 21 that says, but this spoke he of the temple of his body. Okay, so you go, so, so, I think most of us have figured out, and if we hadn't figured out, that the temple represents the temple of his body, that he's going in there and he's saying, get this junk out of here. And he's saying, I will not have this, you know, um, um, take these things from here and make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And, and we see the action that he takes. But, you know, here's an interesting thing. These things were not in his physical body. They were in simply a shadow or something more. I believe the temple was really meant to be more than just a shadow. It was meant to be a representation of what would be. It was seen by Moses and them in the mount, and David got the pattern for the temple. Moses got the ta pattern for the tabernacle. Saw it from the Lord and built it. Jesus is Jesus cannot idly sit by and go, oh, well, it's okay, that's just shadows and this and that. No. He is consumed by even dealing in the natural. No, we must keep this thing in order. We must go properly. We must proceed aright. And not just good and evil aright. I mean according to the pattern, according to the reality that, it, that, that works between him and the Father. And so for that reason... He, if you will, attacks with a vengeance. He doesn't just go, well, you know, I wish, uh, you know, I wish the Bible school could be more spiritual, but, you know, we're not. No. Man. You know, I mean, you get, you get in there, or I, I wish our church would be this or that or whatever, but we're not. No, you get in there, you pray, or you, you hear the Lord, and you drive out, or you do whatever. You, you, you are committed to not peace at any cost but Christ at any cost right and I, let me just read some of the notes that, uh, that I've written 
I wonder if Jesus came to the temple, what would he find? <clears throat> the life in the temple must be Christ, and that's the deal, is that there were a lot of other things in there, but Christ, the temple is nothing more than a representation of his body, right? His body. The temple of his body. And the life that's supposed to be in there is Christ, not you for God or not you against God, but Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory. To me, Paul says in Philippians 1.21, uh, 1, to me, to live is Christ. Colossians 1.23, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Galatians 2.20, uh, 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 I am crucified, nevertheless I live, but not I, Christ liveth in me. And to begin to submit ourselves to the Christ that is there and, be, and act as temple and not lords. To act as temple and not lords. <clears throat> um... The life in the temple must be Christ. He begins to upset our plans and overthrow our religion. And he certainly does, doesn't he? John the Baptist foresaw the coming of Jesus and said the crooked will be made straight, the high will be brought down, the low will be brought up. And he's gonna, there's going to be major upheaval when he comes. And he wasn't talking to the ungodly, idol-worshiping nations. He was talking to the only nation that was his people. <laughs> He begins to upset and overthrow religion. The animals represent what I term deeper life characteristics. The dove represents peace. It was a poor man's sacrifice. But the Bible says, uh, I wrote, he, he, drives out, he drives out peace sought by works which feeds the soul and is from the soul. You know, there's a peace that we want with God based on things, works that we'll do that we think will pacify our God and bring us into peace. It is the Old Testament way of appeasing an angry God through something that we have done. That's the relationship that many of us, that's how we relate to him. Jesus comes in, drives all that out, and says, I am your peace. And you know it says that in the New Testament. He is our peace. Now you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It, you, there's nothing you can do to appease God. The sacrifice of Christ has appeased God. There's nothing that you can do that to, can bring peace. He says, peace I give you. You know? He, but when he comes into his temple and he finds these false methods and these false things, you know, then he says this. I am not come to bring peace in relationship to this stuff, but a sword. We seek, we seek uh, I was talking to somebody about this recently, you know, we seek to, um, to have peace with uh, friends or uh, people that we really love or our loved ones, our family or whatever. And so we go out of the way to make the gospel not a stumbling block. You know, the preaching of Christ is a stumbling block, but we don't want it to be a stumbling block. We don't know Jesus. We want to lay hands on Jesus and turn him from a stumbling block to some glorious, beautiful thing that they can behold and go, oh, I want that. You know, when you see him, there is no beauty that would draw you, not in the outward. And that's where they look, and that's where we tend to look, in the outward. The beauty of the nature that went to the cross, but he was so marred, the Bible says, I mean, you should read the account in uh, Isaiah, not just 53, but in 55 and a few other places, uh, so marred that he was unrecognizable. I mean, they beat him and, the, and all the things that went on. There's no beauty that's going to draw him. He's a stumbling block. But we're always trying to water him down to such a degree that people will rush towards him. I say, you know, instead of, you know, we want to hide the cross. We want to preach Christ, but we don't want to preach Christ and him crucified. You know, we don't want the cross to be, oh, you know, people came up to Jesus, and you'll, you'll find this throughout uh, the Gospel of John. I'll point it out as we get there, but you'll see it over and over. Then the multitudes begin to follow after Jesus, and it says almost on the heels every time, and he turned to the multitudes and says, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross. That's the way he responded. That's, you know, he didn't go, man, this is good, big crowds. This is it. This is what it's all about. It's not all about big crowds. It's all about Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's all about another nature, another life. And if people go, I don't, you know, oh, no, I don't want that. You know, um, the um, rich young ruler, he had the money. He was young. He had the power. 
You know, he comes up to Jesus. Hey, man, I've been doing good. I've kept the, all the commandments. I've done this and that. And Jesus goes right at the motive of his heart to find out, are you really for me? Am I really the treasure? Okay, go sell all and follow me. The issue wasn't money. He didn't tell hardly anybody else that. But he told him that because he wanted to know where his true treasure was. And he went, man, I can't do that, and walked off. You know, Jesus didn't go, hold it, hold it. Come on back. I was just checking. Okay, you're not spiritual enough yet at this point to handle that, so I'm going to compromise and water this thing down so that you can come. Now, your first act is give a big tithe offering. You know, he didn't do that. Jesus never, and you know what it says? And Jesus was sad because he loved him. Jesus loved him. Jesus, he, 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 you know, that's the way the Lord is. Jesus would have, you know, rejoiced to see him go, okay, man, that, that doesn't mean anything to me. But when we start seeing that to preach Christ and him crucified is an offense, which the Bible says that he's a rock of an of, of offense, when we start preaching that and we start seeing the, the effects, then we have to make a decision. What is it that we're really after? What is the real goal? Is it Christ in you, the hope of glory? And is it for people to lay down their self-life, their soul life, lay that down, deny that, and come follow Jesus? Or is it numbers at any cost and warm bodies? And you'll find the Lord never compromised, Paul never compromised, and the true gospel will never be compromised. But many will compromise it, and that's okay. I don't even say those things to condemn them. In fact, it is not my heart at all, and there is no sense of condemnation for others. They will stand before God. That's their business, and I don't even, you know, I don't even think of, I, when I preach this, I don't think of other churches or groups or whatever. All I know is that we must follow the Lord. That doesn't make us better than them. It only makes us obedient. It only makes us doing exactly what we're supposed to do. It doesn't make us better. Uh-huh, Eric? Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I agree with you that there's... I, I mean, I know there have been times... I've probably done that at times... But I know there are also times when that's the Lord, but when somebody's going, you know, there's moving out on more need or whatever. But I'll tell you what, I mean, it can't be, we can't, we can't water down the gospel. You know, we've got to, we've got to receive it just like it is and, and just follow the word of God, the logos of God. And uh, that's, it is going to cost us, you know, it's going to cost, there's always a cost. But that's why Jesus, Jesus is the one who said, well, count the cost. Count the cost. Count the cost in the beginning. Don't don't count it later on and go, oh, man, I really, you know, and this is where if everybody just obeyed that scripture, then you wouldn't have people that go for a while and then drop out. They would have counted the cost, not got that, you know what I'm saying, and then got down the road and going, ah, I don't think I can hack this. You know what I mean? They'd have said, I counted it in the beginning. I can't hack it. That's it. I'm out of here. And you go, that's fine, you know. That's a whole lot better then, you know, and you see it, you know, you start shifting the load and everything, and then somebody, have you ever seen that in a church where somebody walked out that was carrying a huge load, and it just really hurt, and in some cases devastated church? Have you ever seen that happen? I've seen it happen. You just go, oh, God, and it takes a year, two years to recover from that, you know? I've seen it happen. The best thing to do is to just be real with yourself. Counting the cost, I think, is a form of being real with yourself. But I also think it's also... Not, not necessarily counting on your abilities because if you're going to look at your abilities you can forget it most of you if you had known what you've already been through you would never start it 
Because <laughs> you would have known you didn't have the ability. But that's where you, uh, and Paul even said that, literally. Don't trust in your own abilities, but the ability which God give it. The ability which God give it. Um, I think we'll uh, take a break here and then come back in about, just for the fun of it, about seven minutes. And then on the eighth minute, we'll have a new beginning. Just joke.